On the program today, the Business Day crew sat down with Barclays MD on issues of Barclays transitioning to ABSA, financial inclusion, as well as financial literacy in the banking sector. We also talked to the NCC, which is the National Council for Construction, on issues of how people are going around purporting to be agents from the NCC. And a globally renowned university cites Zambia as having sectors that are employable. These are more items on the program. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Business Day and my name is Judy Ngulube. Barclays Bank Zambia is a brand that is known quite well, and now Barclays is transitioning to rebrand itself as ABSA. This has been done in many um, countries, and 12 to be specific is the total number of uh, African countries that ABSA will actually be transitioning to. But then, talking about financial inclusion, financial literacy, and the whole move of the rebranding of Barclays, how is this going to happen? 10th February apparently is the D-Day. But what does the managing director of ABSA Zambia have to say on this one? We announced in uh, 2018 that we're obviously going to use the name ABSA. I think that's the first time after the initial announcements we decided that the name uh, was going to be ABSA. And uh, as you know, just to take you back a bit, you know, Barclays, having been around for 100 years, 102 years in Zambia, actually decided that uh, they needed to deconsolidate and uh, reduce their shareholding from, you know, from over 50% yes. to 14.9. And uh, as we speak, Barclays remains and they'll continue to remain very much part of APSA, but as a minority shareholder. So because they're a minority shareholder, the right thing for us to do was to uh, change the brand, you know, the name, because we couldn't continue using the same name as, you know, as Barclays and the brand. So we went around, you know, the continent, spoke to over 30,000 plus people and who, uh, you know, all felt the right name for us was APSA. Again, the interesting thing, Judy, is that APSA was already part of one of our many brands that we had in the in the bank. Yes. Yeah, so in South Africa, we're always known to be APSA. So what we did was to say, fine, let's get what's already there. And uh, the customers, you know, the regulators and our staff felt that's the right name. And we decided to go with it. The name and APSA. You know, APSA is actually very African, and it's not the old APSA that, that we knew, but it's uh, it, it, it's really um, has a lot of African heritage. Uh, number one, we are listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Uh, number two, we are represented, uh, you know, in, in over 10 countries. So even as APSA, we were already we already had that heritage that was very much linked to Barclays. Uh, but also, I think. Um, when we thought of APSA, we also thought of Africanacity. You know, across the continent, we have a lot of challenges. In Zambia, we have a lot of challenges. However, how do we bring possibilities to life? So in APSA, we felt we saw a lot of uh, alignment to what the continent is all about. It's a continent full of possibility. It's a continent where you come in and you say, you know, as long as you, you, you are ready to do business, you are brave, because you've got to be brave to do business in Africa. You've got to be brave to do business in Zambia. And as long as you are passionate, then we can actually drive, uh, you, you know, the, the continent. So for us, APSA meant so much. And we align it also to Africanacity. Mm. You know, it's a new way that we came up as we thought of APSA. We thought, you know what? It's a new way that doesn't exist anywhere in the dictionary. But we come, came up with a word. And the word just simply means getting things done. Uh, our headquarters is in South Africa. But as country, you know, we are, we are a subsidiary that is regulated by the central bank that has an independent board. So our boards are very keen that we continue to emphasize that they actually run the bank. You know, they, they, you know the reporting line goes into the board. So South Africa is there, yes, our head office to continue to provide us with, um, you know, the expertise that we need. Like, you know, if we're launching a brand, we're able to say, how have you guys done it? We can learn from you so that expert advice we're doing mining uh, you know in the different sectors and you know they're able to say you know in Ghana we ran this on the mining sector maybe you can do this you know to support this segment so that center of excellence exists but the bank is very much run from the country so we continue now to be called Barclays but we are counting down 18 more days to go exciting uh, on the 10th of February 
we now change to APSA. Legally, legally, we're calling it legal day one because PACRA now issues us a certificate which reads you are now trading as APSA. You know, so we now change from Barclays to APSA. So uh, th th that is the legal day one. So you see now everything, all our branches, we've been able to convert all our branches, nearly, nearly all our branches by that day will be called APSA. Nearly all our systems would have been migrated to APSA. You know, we've been having conversations with our staff as well, just to just to reassure them that this is exciting. Uh, you know, it, it, it you know it, it's a change in the name, uh, it's a change in the brand. So this is really uh, you know exciting for us. So on that day, what is really going to change is that legally we are now called. We now change. And it's important to uh, to emphasize that what we're changing is the name. Mm -hmm. We now change the name. The bank, the infrastructure, who we are, remains who we are. But what changes is the name. So from the 10th of February, we are now called APSA. However, we have until June to uh, continue using Barclays. So maybe you'll find a Barclays something there, uh, you know, a Barclays card. It's okay you know, the customer should not panic because that will be done transitionally. And we have an agreement with, uh, with Barclays mm -hmm. that uh, we don't want the customers to all think, you know, they have to change their cards on the first day. As their cards expire, the new one we issue from now actually will be called APSA. For us, it's, it's about how do we, uh, you know, put our money where our mouth is so that we're not just, we're not just talking, but we're also, proper, you know, doing action. Uh, so some of the propositions that we have done uh, is to uh, work with the mobile companies and partner and, uh, you know, being the first bank to have introduced bank to wallet, meaning even if you don't have a bank, as long as you have a, a phone and a wallet, we are able to transfer money from the bank to the wallet. And when you grow, because we expect even customers who are financially included to grow to a point where they now have a bank account, you can transfer money from your wallet to the bank. I think gone are the days where uh, you, you just stuck to your own way of doing things and say banks will be about brick and mortar, it will be about you bring money to the bank and if you can't do that then you can't deal with that. Those days are gone. Now it's about partnerships. That's why we look at mobile companies and say we can do business with you and partner. Yesterday I spent time with the, with the MTN, MD, and it was like there are areas where we'll compete and there are areas where we'll partner, but the main ones are the areas where we'll partner. Village banking is one and group savings where we we'll partner with them. We even have an account called uh, village banking or group savings account where you can actually come to the bank and you are saved, your individual names will be, will be identified there. So we'll partner with them because they'll do their thing by making sure that the women get uh, the money that they're saving, but they, it has to be kept safe somewhere. That's where the APSA comes in. So we have the APSA group savings account. So we don't really look at it at anybody eating into our share. For us, we're confident enough to, and humble enough, to recognize that we can partner with, with anyone and we can still make it work. That was Mzinga Melu, MD Absa Zambia, talking about the transition which is going to be happening in Zambia on the 10th of February. And now they also, she also commented on financial inclusion as well as financial literacy. We move on with the program. We have um, engineer Ernest Shindano. He is the director of registration and um, regulation from the National Construction Council. We are glad you've joined us in studio. How are you? Um, thank you very much, and I'm happy to be here. All right. How's okay. the NCC? Well, the NCC is doing well. Um, so far, so good. All right. Tell us about this uh, thing of people going around purporting to be agents from the NCC. Uh, thank you very much. To begin with, um, let me first of all highlight what the National Council for Construction is. Um, it is a body, a statutory body that is mandated by the Act of Parliament Number 13 of 2003, and um, our core mandate is to regulate and to develop the construction sector to ensure that the sector um, uh, is, is well regulated and the sanity and that um, projects are built and developed with quality and according to specifications. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, then we begin to regulate the behavior of contractors and any person that is undertaking construction works. Uh, so basically, that's what um, we do. And in line with that, then, of course, you know, you begin to find a lot of people wanting to begin to 
um, uh, do things that are not according to the law. And that's why we, as the National Council for Construction now, we are very, very strict and very serious this time around. We are not tolerating any misconduct from any person. Um, according to uh, the National Council for Construction Code of Conduct uh, Regulation um, of 2008, um, the, the, the National Council for Construction Act empowers the National Council for Construction to be able to uh, regulate the industry using the code of conduct. So any person that is practicing or wants to be involved in the construction sector, they are regulated by the code of conduct. So the number of issues that now are arising where individuals are taking advantage um, of unsuspecting contractors of clients, we want to uh, resound a strong warning to them and that we are watching and I'm sure I'll be able to highlight on some of these things. So how are they how are they able to do this? Go around to contractors and actually make them believe that they are coming from the NCC? Yeah, I, th I think the first and foremost, it comes from probably a lack of awareness by the contractors and the public at large. Uh, the National Council for Construction does not engage any form of agencies Okay, we have qualified monitors and, and inspectors who monitor projects or qualified employed by the National Council for Construction and they have the IDs. So no one should go around reporting that they're agents. Of course, I've received in my office calls from all over the country to say we have these agents and they are charging us so much money to be able to be the go between between the council and themselves. Mm -hmm. So there's no such a thing. All those that are doing that are doing at their own uh, are, are on um, uh, risk and ig ignoring what the law uh, says. So we want to urge actually the public there that there's, there are no agencies. If you want anything, please contact the National Council for Construction. We'll be able to assist. So it's illegal. But this, these agents are, are issuing certificates, they're issuing all sorts of documentation. How are they able to do that? Where are they getting those from? Um, you see, uh, uh, you know, people are now are uh, very cunning and, and, and with technology, people are able to do everything to begin with. We always encourage, first of all, um, all the entities that are contracting out works and are engaging contractors, we will always encourage them to verify with the National Council for Construction. You see, it's very easy for one to display and flash a certificate of practice from the National Council for Construction, maybe, which is not genuine. So the best thing that you can do, you can do on our database, on, on the website, and you'll be able to check and confirm the legitimacy of that certificate. Or you may indeed contact or come to our offices in Choma, in Kitu, or in Lusaka, we'll be able to confirm that. So first of all, the public must be able to understand the need to confirm with the council if they're not sure. Number two, people are forging uh, you know, documents nowadays, you know, they can forge any document. So we want to urge uh, those that are participating or engaging in such kind of behavior that right now as the council, we are, we are prosecuting a number of cases and um, the, the penalties are very serious. You know, you'll be, you'll be jailed for maximum of three years. Talking about penalties, I know some of these cases are in court. Uh, one currently going on and the other which uh, has already, you know, uh, been dealt with. Tell us about the one that has been dealt with and some, some of the penalties that have been made. Yeah, um, maybe before I go to that, I would want to um, refer us to uh, part one of the code of conduct, uh, what is called professional conduct, then part two talks about professional misconduct. Mm -hmm. So now the, the, the section one says, a contractor shall not undertake, carry out or complete any construction works awarded in terms of competitive tender, quotation or otherwise, unless the contractor is registered under the act. So first of all, the contractor must be registered. Now, if you have a forged certificate, it means you are not registered. So there's also actually a danger, before I talk about the cases we are prosecuting, there's actually a danger if a contractor is, is given a false certificate by these agents, purported mm -hmm. agents, there's a danger. But let me come to these who are forging. Um, currently, we've, we've about five cases, and three have come to a successful conclusion. The courts have concluded them. And um, we had a case which is called the People versus uh, Cedric Shamavanse in Livingstone, and it was in Livingstone Magistrate Court. And the accused has been convicted to three years imprisonment. 
and uh, we had another one uh, the people versus Mwila uh, Chitungula in Chingola and uh, 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 the accused was acquitted mm -hmm. then we had another one the people versus Sylvester Kabamba in Lusaka Magistrate Courts the accused convicted to two years imprisonment and then we have the ongoing trials right now in Saka because they're ongoing I don't want to cite them so we yes, have got course. two cases already that are ongoing another one in Lusaka uh, the people versus uh, Chilito Zulu and this one the accused was imprisoned to three years so what happens if I'm a contractor and I've been issued this I, w I did not suspect that um, I was being duped and I have this certificate and I have everything going what happens to me as a contractor exactly and that's why we are trying to caution the contractors the genuine contractors because remember the the, the the inconvenience is too much because then you have to go through the court processes you have to the court has to be convinced that really you didn't participate or didn't sponsor that uh, 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 lawlessness so I, I think that's why it's it's very I think prudent for every contractor to ensure that in the beginning they're very sure listen we are saying that uh, you can confirm registration we are saying we don't use any agents and people think it's difficult to register it is not difficult it's very straightforward and they actually are charged more than they are supposed to pay to the council for registration so I think it's just prudent and wise that they take time to avoid these litigations and it's not easy for you to be extricated out of a court litigation you know what I mean so I think it's important that uh, people are aware and be able to approach the National Council for Construction for anything. All right, Mr. Shindano, before I let you go, there's always issues in the media, stories in the media talking about Zambian contractors, you know, not being very uh, dedicated to some of the tenders that they win. 2020, mm -hmm. are we expecting mm -hmm. such stories? Mm -hmm. What's the, yeah. your take on that? Uh, and and that's, that's very true. And um, it's just on the, the code of conduct I was reading for contractors. Uh, Subsection 2 says contractor to undertake works in a grade in which they are registered. Now, if a contractor fails to perform, there are two reasons. One, maybe they got a job that is bigger than their capacity. And, 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 and we expect a, con, a contractor to be able to uh, progress um, in stages so that they're able to manage. But just to answer your question, we are not going to take very kindly this time around uh, we have been normally charging them penalties, but this time around we'll be prioritizing prosecution in the courts because the court gives us, the, the, the charges, the penalties give us two options. We can charge you penalties or we can uh, prosecute you through the courts of the law. And in most cases, the penalties is not less than two years, mm -hmm. it's not maximum of two years. So we want to warn the Zambian contractors that that's the, not the option we want to take. And that's why we take time to train them and develop them. But we are very serious this time around in 2020 onwards. If you do not perform, we will not let you go. We will make sure that the law takes its course. All right. So no penalties, just the law taking its course. Yes. I appreciate you coming through. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be All here. Right. Thank you. I have been talking to engineer Enes Shindano. He is the director of registration and uh, regulation at the National Council for Construction here in Lusaka, Zambia. Issues of fraudulent practices going round as well as commenting on how uh, they will deal with contractors who are not abiding to uh, the contractual obligations for the year 2020. You're watching business day. You are still watching Business Day, and now we get to educational issues versus what the job market has. A globally renowned university, Edith Cohen University, had a showcase recently in Lusaka, Zambia. They are saying that Zambia is one of those African countries that have sectors that are employable, bankable, and have seen a capacity in its people as well as those that are applying at their university to add not only to Zambia but Africa as as a whole. We sat down with them. Yes, like you say, those, those demands, particularly in Africa, are growing, they're dynamic, they're emerging. What we offer at ECU are degrees, as I said, they're very cutting edge. Uh, some of the focus of today is on jobs like project management, cyber security. Um, particularly in Africa, there's, there's a lot of need for really upskilling and capacity building in the health sciences areas, education, uh, quite broad. 
how we like to approach this is it's a student journey. And that journey really begins with students and their parents. And that journey begins from their schooling, whether it be primary or secondary. So it's that whole cycle of the students and their parents deciding on the future for their children. And that we take as our view of how we want to counsel them for the future. Today's employee will look much different to tomorrow's employee, and we're already seeing it happen. You need that international experience. You need what used to be called the liberal arts sort of view, where you have experience in not just your, your micro discipline, but a more broad field of understanding. So if you're going to do accounting, for example, do you also have the experience that can take you, say, into business administration? Um, if you're doing law, uh, how are you doing law across you know, industries, culture? So it's quite dynamic with the student programs today. Edith Cowan University, um, our peers have ranked us as one of the top universities for student satisfaction. We've got a five-star teacher uh, teaching and learning rating in the past five years. Um, so it really comes down to what the student is getting in the classroom. As I said, we started out uh, as a teacher's college that Edith Cowan founded. So it's really in our DNA to, to promote uh, students to have that learning experience and to be ready for tomorrow. Degrees of today and emerging in tomorrow is it's more about project management, say if you're doing business than business administration. Students less and less are doing IT and more focusing on cybersecurity. Huge demand in cybersecurity. That, that is a, a field of great interest. Great interest, I think, to, to Zambians, Pan African. Uh, I think every country needs nation building, especially in developing world. So whether that be in health, nursing, social work, all fantastic areas of study. That item there wraps up business day for today. Thank you so much for having stayed with us. Join us next week, 18.30 Thursday at the same time for more information on business, the corporate world, and entrepreneurship. On behalf of the entire production crew, I'm Judy Ngulube.